Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I welcome you all to the third lecture of module 1 and the title of today's lecture is biology of stress. So, before we talk about today's lecture, let me have a brief recap of the lecture 2 that is previous lecture. So, in the last lecture, uh, we discussed uh, various characteristics of stress. So, we have discussed that stress is subjective and largely subjective and uh, it can be self created. Uh, we have also discussed that you know stress is an everyday phenomena uh, because on, on day to day basis we all experience stress. So, it is not something and exclusively happens only when in only in certain occasions. Uh, we, are, we have also discussed that stress can have additive or cumulative effects uh, which basically means you know. Uh, when we have multiple stressful events in a day and all may have a cumulative effect on our system, mind and body. Uh, we have also discussed that you know stress can be influenced by culture primarily because culture influences our thought processes, interpretation processes. So, in that sense you know uh, culture can also influence how we interpret a situation. Uh, we have also discussed that you know stress can have spillover effect with the idea that you know stress can uh, you know get transferred from one domain of life to another domain of life for like you know from workplace to family life. So, that is called as spillover effect. We have also discussed that you know stress can be contagious in the sense that you know uh, stress can you know transfer from one person to another person particularly people who are close to us. Uh, so, it is a kind of contagious in that sense. We have also discussed uh, the different types of stress. Uh, most importantly, you know, we have discussed uh, acute stress uh, versus chronic stress. We have also discussed distress versus eustress. So these are different ways of categorizing stress. We have discussed all these things in the last lecture. Uh, we have also discussed various sources of stress. Uh, uh, particularly, we have discussed. Uh, the frustrations in life can be a source of uh, stress. Conflicts in various situations of life can also lead to stressful uh, you know, experiences. Uh, certain life changes can be very stressful and also we have discussed pressure to perform in a situation or pressure to conform to a uh, norms or something can also be uh, stressful. So, these are some of the major concepts that we have discussed in the last lecture. So, today we will discuss uh, the biology of stress, so physiological aspect of stress. Uh, so, uh, the key concepts that we will discuss in today's lecture include fight or flight response, general adaptation syndrome, stress brain body pathways and lastly gender differences in stress response. So, let us start one by one. So, stressful experiences are always associated with certain physiological changes in the body. So, we have already uh, tried to understand you know the mental experiences you know we will also look into more detail about the mind body interaction. So, the mental experiences of the stress you know directly influences your physiology or the body. So, stress is always associated with certain changes in the body level. Oh, so, some of these physiological changes we will discuss which are commonly associated with stressful experiences. So, one uh, 
response, physiological response, uh, which is very common, is called as fight or flight response. So, this was coined by a scientist named Walter Cannon in 1932, uh, who first described body's reaction to stress in terms of fight or flight response. So, this is also called as uh, acute stress response. So, mostly whenever there is an acute stress, uh, then generally the body uh, responds with the fight or flight response. It basically is a kind of physiological reaction of the body uh, as a result of any threat or stressful situations. So, in the fight or flight response, uh, it, uh, it mobilizes and prepares body either for fight or you know you just stand and fight with the situation or if it is not possible to fight then you run away or flee which is called as flight uh, when conf confronted by a threat. So, uh, this is a typical physiological reaction that happens you know body kinds of prepares you to fight or the or run away from the situation. Uh, and you know uh, mostly this response happens or it is mediated by you know autonomic nervous system and specifically one part of autonomic nervous system called sympathetic nervous system. So, let us very briefly you know talk about the structure of nervous system in order to understand you know what is autonomic nervous system and what is sympathetic nervous system. So, if you look at human nervous system, so it is divided into two parts, uh, one is called as central nervous system and one is called as peripheral nervous system. So, central nervous system includes brain and spinal cord. Uh, so, these are the two components of central nervous system. All the remaining nervous system is called as peripheral nervous system, which includes all nerves outside the brain and spinal cord and it includes sensory and motor neurons. So, apart from brain and spinal cord, all the other aspects of nervous system are collectively called as peripheral nervous system. So, then peripheral nervous system is again divided into two parts, one is called as somatic nervous system and another part is called as autonomic nervous system. Somatic nervous system basically conducts nerve impulses from central nervous system to skeletal muscles. So, it is it you know conducts nerve impulses from central nervous system to the skeletal muscles and it primarily controls all the voluntary function. For example, I am moving my hand, you know I am walking with my legs. So, all these voluntary uh, functions are primarily done by somatic nervous system. Uh, then the other part is called autonomic nervous system. It basically you know conducts nerve Im impulses from nervous central nervous system to various internal organs and gland. So, heart you know various glands like you know thyroid gland, pancreas etcetera etcetera. So, all the internal organs and glands are connected by you know controlled by autonomic nervous system and these are mostly involuntary functions performed by, uh, uh, autonomic nervous system functions are primarily involuntary functions. Uh, because we cannot control them, is th th these are beyond our control. So, we cannot control heartbeat and other things for example. So, because that is why it is uh, called as autonomic nervous system. So, it uh, controls functions such as heart rate, digestion, perspiration, etcetera. Now, autonomic nervous system is again divided into two parts, one is called as sympathetic nervous system and one is called as parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic nervous system is basically it activates body or it arouses body, stimulates body uh, and to mobilize all the resources. So, whenever we get activated and lot of energy comes because there is a threat in front of us, uh, then it is primarily done by the sympathetic part of the nervous system. So, this fight and flight response is primarily done by this whenever we encounter a stressful situation sympathetic nervous system gets activated and it activates all the you know physiological aspects such as increase in the heart rate plus perspiration etc etc parasympathetic nervous system on the other hand you know it 
kind of does the opposite of sympathetic nervous system. When the body gets aroused by sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system tries to maintain balance by, by decreasing the arousal of the body system. So, it uh, tries to conserve bodily resources such as it slows heart rate and other things. So, um, if I just you know try to draw a very you know roughly, if we consider you know human brain Let us consider this is human brain. So, so central nervous system includes brain and spinal cord. Peripheral nervous systems basically goes from brain and spinal cord to all the other parts of the body. So, nerves will be kind of you know it will be you know so different branches it will connect to our hands different body parts. So, it will go to our hands. So, different nerves will go different internal organs then it will go to different parts of our leg. So, all these branches are basically part of our peripheral nervous system. So, if you if you if you if you just kind of you know uh, make an analogy with the electric grid system, then central nervous system is like you know powerhouse that gives you power and peripheral nervous system is more like you know cables that connect power highs with the different parts of the city. Uh, so, similarly you know brain and spinal cord is the power house and it connects with the different nerves with the different parts of the body and internal organs uh, using peripheral nervous system. So, this is uh, like that only. So, fight and flight response is basically a kind of uh, survival mechanism. It is a body's way of dealing with the threat. So, it helps us to survive in a threatening situation, in a stressful situation and this is very rapid and uh, it happens very unconsciously. You know, We may not be consciously aware, but whenever there is a threat in front of us, we encounter a threat. Uh, body automatically activates you know sympathetic part of nervous system and it mobilizes energies distributes energy to the different parts of the body uh, wherever it is required uh, physical symptoms uh, during the flight and flight response primarily include you know like you know heartbeat increases muscle get tensed uh, mouth becomes dry dilation of pupil of the eye of sweating of the palms and these are some of the common symptoms that we experience you know when undergoing stressful circumstances. So, typically in the fight f uh, fight or flight response these are the common symptoms that we experience. Now, once the threat is over we have discussed that parasympathetic nervous system you know tries to return the body to normal relaxed state because body cannot stay in that aroused state for a long time because it is very exhausting. So, parasympathetic nervous system tries to bring body to the normal uh, relaxed state. So, Walter Cannon used the term homeostasis mechanism uh, that you know body always tries to maintain its equilibrium by being bringing back to a normal state. Uh, so, this is called as homeostasis mechanism uh, otherwise we will not be able body will not be able to survive for long time if it is in the aroused state for a long time. So, parasympathetic nervous system tries to maintain that balance. Uh, 
Another important thing, the thing is that fight or flight response uh, can happen in the face of an actual danger such as let's say you see suddenly a snake in front of you. So this is an actual danger. So body will show flight and fight and flight response, but it can also be body can sh uh, you know, show all the symptoms of fight and flight response to an imagined threat also. Let us say uh, uh, you, know, uh, you want to appear for a public speak speech or you want to you know, give a presentation in front of people. Uh, so, just imagining such a task can become uh, you can become stressed by that simply because you know when depending on your interpretation process which we have discussed. So, because brain cannot make difference between actually actual threat and an imaging threat, the body will react in a very similar fashion. So, this is one important uh, reaction uh, response of the physiological response of the body called fight and flight response. Uh, next, uh, another uh, physiological response of the body which is called as general adaptation syndrome or in short term it is called as GAS gas. Now, this was proposed by one uh, endocrinologist, his name was Hans Selye who was one of the founding researcher in the field of stress and he studied changes in the body's physiology in the reaction to stress. Uh, mostly he was doing research with the rats obviously and then it was found it was similar changes happens in the human body also. So, what kind of physiological changes happens you know, as we or what are the stages of changes that happens when we encounter short term and long term stress. So, fight and flight is primarily in terms of short term or acute stress, uh, but what happens when stress persists for a long time, what are the stages that our body goes through. So, general adaptation syndrome tries to explain that. So, Hans Selye summarized body's short and long term reaction to stress in a three stages or three phased process called as general adaptation syndrome. So, first uh, stage is called as alarm reaction. So, alarm reaction is basically when you first encounter a stress or threat then it is typically fight or flight response that we experience is alarm stage. So, once you recognize a threat here essentially it is fight and flight response uh, that occurs and there are physiological changes associated with it that we have just discussed. So, alarm reaction is typically fight and flight response. The next phase is called as the stage of resistance or resistance stage. Uh, so, what happens after the initial alarm reaction, uh, the body tries to begins to repair itself you know, or parasympathetic nervous system tries to cool down and bring it back to the normal state uh, and body tries to enter into the recovery phase for a while, but still it remains in a very vigilant state. So, if you overcome stress then it is fine, then there is no problem, but if stress continues beyond fight and flight response, uh, then the body enters into, into the stage of resistance and here body tries to adapt and learns how to live with the higher stress level or continued stress level. And it makes various changes and adaptations in the body in order to reduce the effect of stress. Uh, for example, you know body continues to secrete various stress hormones, we will discuss uh, what are the stress hormones and all these things in the just, uh, just after, after some time and tries to maintain high blood pressure. It includes signs of, uh, you may experience you know symptoms of irritability, you know, frustrations, poor concentration etcetera during the phase of uh, resistance stage. Uh, so, body tries to resist to higher stress level or continued stress level tries to fight it and you know and by you know again mobilizing other various resources by secretion of stress hormones etcetera etcetera. Uh, so, this is a kind of you know continued fighting stage of the body. So, body resists to all these changes. The next stage is called the exhaustion, exhaustion stage 
in the stage of exhaustion uh, if the stress is not you know resolved in second stage and it continues for a long time then for substantial amount of time uh, one may enters into the stage of exhaustion here the body's resistance to stress uh, gradually decreases because bo body has body was trying to fight for a long time in the resistance stage uh, but you know there is a limit to it and slowly slowly the resistance slows down and decreases sometimes it may collapse very quickly and reduce our immune function so we look into all these other aspects also when we talk about how stress influences our health so this is the stage where you know various diseases physical diseases may you know uh, may appear in him in our body because of you know collapse of resistance so for example people may uh, you know ex experience you know symptoms of ulcers high blood pressure etc etc so most of the uh, so this is the most uh, <coughs> dangerous stage <coughs> that is why we have discussed that chronic stress is mo most problematic stress because when it continues stress continues for a long time the body enters in the stage of exhaustion and it is not able to resist anymore and it is in this stage that many diseases may come appear in the body uh, because of inability of the body to fight so you know various heart diseases you know ulcers high blood pressures etc etc so here uh, typically you know some of the symptoms you know one may experience such as fatigue you no know, burnout uh, decrease of stress resistance etc and uh, our body's immune system may go down so we'll look into the mechanism of uh, immune system and stress also so uh, these are uh, some of the stages or primary stages that our body goes through when we experience stress so it may start with alarm reaction then the body enters if it continues enters into resistance stage however if body is not able to resolve stress at that stage and it continues then the body enters into exhaustion stage where you know the body uh, kind of exhaust all its energy and resources and the body this is the phase where diseases physical diseases Uh, may be experienced by the people so diagrammatically you know this can be shown so if you have a graph like this so graphically we can present these three stages like that so this is one side we are showing the resistance to stress and one time as the time progresses so initially we have alarm stage there is not much resistance at this stage the body just start showing uh, the symptoms of fight and flight then slowly slowly the resistance increases as the time passes and then after certain time the uh, resistance starts decreasing and sometimes it may collapse very quickly so this is the phase of uh, uh this is the phase of exhaustion where you know the resistance goes down very quickly and you know or slowly uh, so uh, graphically we can just you know present these stages you know like this uh now let us talk about how stress is connected to brain and body what are the you know the detailed pathways through which you know stress influences our body and brain and ultimately it you know leads to various symptoms on the body so 
Uh, this is a diagrammatic representation of how stress is connected to our brain and body. So, if you see when uh, someone experiences stress, uh, one thing is you know it one part of our brain, small part of our human brain called amygdala, it gets activated. Amygdala is primarily responsible for emotional processing. So, whenever we get distress, so there is an emotional distress, amygdala get act activated and then it sends signal to hypothalamus, another part of the human brain uh, and which is kind of a control center in the brain and it kind of controls other body parts. So, we will see how it controls other body parts. So, if you see in a diagram, so amygdala will be somewhere, uh, no? So, amygdala is somewhere here and hypothalamus is somewhere here. So, during the stress amygdala gets activated and then it sends signal to hypothalamus. So, hypothalamus then what happens? It activates two pathways. One pathway is called as you know. SAM system. So, hypothalamus, once hypothalamus gets activated, you know, it activates uh, two pathways which ultimately uh, ends up in releasing uh, various stress hormones. So, one pathway is called as you know, SAM pathways, which basically means sympathetic adrenal medullary system. So, this is called as sympathetic adrenal medullary path system. What happens here? Hypothalamus activates autonomic nervous system, particularly the sympathetic part of uh, nervous system and sympathetic nervous system then activates adrenal medulla. So, adrenal there is a gland called adrenal gland uh, because it is near to kidney, renal basically means kidney and it is near to kidney. So, that is why it is called as adrenal gland. So, we can kind of uh, you can see here uh, diagram. This is uh, these are the two glands which are called as adrenal gland. So, they are uh, just above the kidney. These are small two, two small structures above the kidney they are called adrenal gland. So, sympathetic nervous system activates adrenal medulla, medulla basically adrenal gland or every gland has a outer layer called cortex called adrenal cortex and the inner part is called as medulla. So, autonomic nervous system activates the inner part of adrenal gland called adrenal medulla and this inner part of adrenal gland secretes a group of hormones called as catecholamines, which basically uh, you know includes uh, hormones such as you know adrenaline, which is also called as epinephrine. Uh, so, it is called as adrenaline which is also called as epinephrine and another is called as you know so this group includes this uh, hormones called adrenaline and non adrenaline so adrenaline is a very common you know, know very popular hormones most of you know when we get highly activated we want to enhance our performance you know it, people say no it is an adrenal rush that you get highly activated. So, these hormones when they are released in the blood uh, they does some functions such as you know increase cardiovascular response, they increase this respiration rate, they increase our perspiration rate, they increase blood flow to active muscles, increase muscle strength, increase mental activities. So, these are some of the functions that are done by uh, this adrenaline and non adrenaline. So, uh, which were re which are released by the medulla or the inner part of adrenal gland. So, this is one one part. 
or one pathway by which stress releases hormones in the body and which ultimately you know does some functions in the body. In the another part pathway which is called as HPA which basically means hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical pathway. So, what happens uh, hypothalamus in another also, also activates pituitary gland. So, pituitary gland is basically you know it is a small gland located just below hypothalamus and it is called as a master gland because it kind you know controls all the other glands. So, pituitary glands one it is act, once it is activated it releases a hormone called as adrenocorticotropic hormone which in short it is called as ACTH. This hormone activates adrenal cortex. So, basically you know so this outer layer cortex sympathetic nervous system activates this medulla inner part adrenal cortex uh, adrenocorticotropic hormone ACTH activates this outer layer called cortex part and this cortex then releases a group of hormones that is called as corticosteroids one example is called as cortisol. So, when this hormone called cortisol is released in the blood uh, it activates certain functions in the body such as increased mobilization of protein and fat, increased access to energy storage, you know, decreased inflammation and all these these are the functions that are done by uh, these hormones. So, this pathway same pathway this part is, is actually is very quick you know it is very fast. is very quick and mostly it activates within 1 minutes you know of a threat. So, this is very quick. So, uh, it is basically acute stress whenever there is a stress and immediately body prepares. So, this pathway is very quick and it immediately gets into the you know it gets activated and does all the functions. This part is relatively slow. It may take about 30 minutes to get activated uh, and it is primar primarily you know works when under the uh, chronic stress condition. So, whenever we face chronic stress primarily this path becomes more active. So, depending so both slow and quick pathways gets activated when we encounter you know stressful situation. So, and ultimately both the pathways releases stress hormones in the blood and they ultimately you know kinds of uh, kind of mobilizes body and gives energy and resources uh, and it, it is distributed in the parts of the body where it is necessary. Uh, next we will see uh, how specifically stress is connected to the brain. So, we have seen overall in the different how it is related to hormones and you know release of hormones. Now, we will see how some of the research findings related specifically to how it influences uh, our brain when we experience stress. Now, stress influences two major part of human brain. Uh, one is called as prefrontal cortex and another is called as hippocampus. Now, so if you see you know the cortex of the brain, so outer part of the brain. So, the front is called prefrontal cortex and hipp hippocampus is another uh, an another you know small organ or small part in the human brain which is responsible for learning memory and emotions also. So, these two part are particularly as far as uh, some of the recent research shows that they are influenced by you know stress experiences. So, what happens is that chronic uh, release of stress hormones. So, let us say stress, particularly in the chronic stress and that HPA HP axis becomes more active which releases cortisol. Uh, so, chronic stress particularly leads to the release of cortisol which adversely influences both prefrontal cortex which is responsible for executive functions such as memory, decision making, regulation of thoughts and emotions. So, all the higher brain functions which are related to thinking you know memory functions 
So, they will be adversely affected by chronic stress because it influences adversely affects uh, prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus by influencing it, it will uh, you know, influence our learning and memory and emotions also. So, basically you know uh, stress by influencing our brain, it will adversely affect you know various functions or disrupt various functions such as emotions, memory functions, learning ability, decision making, regulation of thoughts and emotion and etcetera. So, in a study by Justin B in 2018 found that high level of blood cortisol uh, was associated with poorer memory cognitive functionings particularly for the woman. Obviously, it was there for men also, but it was more pronounced with the women's sample. It was also associated with lower total cerebral brain volume. So, this uh, 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 Justin B and his colleagues basically you know they collected data from 2231 uh, healthy middle aged people and they kind of collected their cortisol level from the blood and various you know cognitive functions and from that they found this. Uh, findings that cortisol level is associated with you know uh, poorer memory and cognitive functions. So, another uh, uh, this study also shows that you know there it is a possible that you know it can shrink uh, in terms of physical volume of the brain particularly prefrontal cortex of the brain. So, as uh, the earlier studies also suggest that chronic stress has a shrinking effect of the prefrontal cortex. Shrinking effect means actually it reduces the physical volume of the prefrontal cortex. How it can do it by you know uh, by a function uh, by a uh, phenomena called as you know neural atrophy that is by killing or removing uh, some of the, um, the neurons in the brain. Uh, so, basically uh, particularly cortisol is responsible for this kind of thing. It adversely affects the functioning of prefrontal cortex by making even structural change such as neural atrophy in the region particularly prefrontal cortex. So, it can actually physically shrink the prefrontal cortex of the brain by killing uh, neurons in that region. So, chronic stress also increases the activity of amygdala which is primarily responsible for emotional reactions and it makes it very hyperactive. So, as a result it may predispose people to be in the constant state of flight and fight or flight response. So, what happens is you know when you know under emotional situations particularly stressful situation. So, all the energy mostly gets you know gets to certain parts of the brain particularly which are responsible for emotional aspects such as amygdala and other part of brain may not have much energy uh, you know uh, such as prefrontal cortex uh, because you know. So, it may hamper higher cognitive functioning such as thinking and decision making etcetera. So, stress can have uh, this kind of particularly specific impact on human brain uh, you know and uh, it particularly you know influences certain as part of the brain as far as some of the research shows and it can even physically you know kill some neurons in some part of the brain such as you know prefrontal cortex. Uh, some research also shows that you know stress can disrupt synaptic regulation. So, synapse is basically the junction between two neurons is called synapse and uh, synaptic regulation means you know the connective connection between one neuron to another this is how the through neural impulse, this is how messages are passed you know through synaptic uh, connections. So, stress can kind of has an as, as adverse impact on synaptic regulation also some research at least shows brain cell connectivity may be disrupted. So, uh, for example, you know some of the research I, uh, done by Vendor, Koji and others in 2014, uh, they show you know uh, stress can disrupt synaptic regulation resulting in the loss of sociability and avoidance of interaction with others and may impact our memory functions. So, this particular research they found a particular enzyme called MMP9 uh, which is triggered by stress reaction and attacks molecule in the hippocampus 
which is responsible for regulating synapse. So, it kind of by attacking him of hippocampus, it uh, you know uh, disrupt synaptic regulation. So, this is also another finding that is you know uh, shows how stress can influence our brain. Now, some of the research also shows there is a possibility of gender difference in the reaction of stress response, particularly in the fight and flight response. So, uh, generally research shows fight and flight response is a kind of primary physiological response uh, generally shown by all individuals and it is a kind of universal thing. However, some, re, uh, some of the research, uh, some specific research particularly by Taylor and his colleagues uh, in 2000 also found that uh, the response, uh, fight and flight response may be little bit different in, in the case of females. Uh, and it is more marked by another phenomena called as tend and befriend. Although fight and flight response can be there, but you know female shows more prominent tend and befriend uh, you know, symptoms uh, when they encounter stress, particularly acute stress. So, what is what is the meaning of this is that you know this theory suggests that under stress you know females show more tending behavior which basically means by giving more attention to nurturing activities or nurturant activities such as caring for the offspring and dependents. So, uh, so tending behavior gets activated in the females particularly for offspring and the dependents people who are dependent on them. Uh, to protect and reduce stress. So, they show one, one aspect is tending behavior to reduce their uh, stress level and also they show befriending behavior uh, under stressful circumstances more uh, you know by creating and maintaining social network to aid in the process of protection and reducing stress. So, they kind of tend to build try to maintain social network and get you know aid in the process of protection which can help in the process of protection. Now, at least you know some uh, at least some biological evidence shows that it is possible that you know females show more tend and befriend symptoms under stress reaction more than males. One evidence comes from uh, a biological support of this theory at least partially comes from the release of oxytocin or hormone uh, which was prime which is main, mainly produced in the hypothalamus. So, oxytocin is also released as a response to stress, but it is more influentially among females. So, it is oxytocin also released under stress, but it is more released in the, among females and this oxytocin uh, hormone uh, the fu it functions in terms of calming the females. So, it helps you to calm by reducing anxiety and promotes this hormones also promotes affiliative behavior such as you know grooming touching bonding behavior so at least this is one of the partial support of you know uh, uh, support for tendon befriend symptom for females under stress so there can be an evolutionary reason also why this is possible uh, is that you know uh, from the throughout the history female have been uh, you know females have been primarily you know uh, they are responsible for caring offspring. So, this is one of the primary tasks that females have been doing and therefore, if they typically involve in fight and flight response under threat then it may not be evolutionarily functional because if they fight they may be you know injured and become unable to defend their offspring. If they flee also uh, then their offspring is left unprotected. So, for females particularly engaging in fight and flight response is not, it may endanger species. So, that was one of the evolutionary reason possible that is why you know they show little bit different symptoms probably tendon befriend which helps in protecting the offspring and maintaining the species. So, this could be also another way of looking at it. Uh, but uh, fight and flight response is very much is a universal and all people show it, but tendon befriend may be more prominent among females as compared to males. With this we end today's lecture. Thank you.